Um, so I've got lots of lots of questions that uh, I want to ask. I mean, I agree with everybody about the peer group pressure, um, but it seems to me that the price is very important. I totally agree with you there. I mean, I did a thing with the BBC of being on the streets for 10 days, and people drank that white striped cider, and you're able to afford a great deal of it for very little. Um, why do you say that it would be illegal to um, have a minimum price? Uh, minimum be, unit price, not a tax price. Uh, because the courts have decreed that it would be for 30 years. There was a court case uh, back in 1978 on minimum unit price for alcohol in the Netherlands, and the European Court of Justice said that was uh, illegal in, uh, interference in the market. There have been other court cases, uh, and they're not quite exactly the same because there's a slight difference in terms of the legislation. But for tobacco, they've not been able to bring in uh, France, uh, Austria, Ireland were banned from bringing in minimum pricing on tobacco. So the principle is set. Now, in theory, yes, it could be possible if a public health exemption could be shown uh, to override the trade rules. But it is seen a prima facie barrier to trade because it stops a low-cost producer in one part of the world competing because of the minimum price. And what the court has said is that if countries wish to introduce price controls or price mechanisms, they should do so through taxation. So there is a mechanism available to governments which is taxation. And indeed many advocates, or some advocates uh, who have written on this, advocates supporting minimum price, have said that they do not see how a case can be built uh, that minimum price can do something that taxation cannot. And therefore, I think talking about minimum pricing means that we're getting distracted from the jurisprudence. Mm. You obviously don't agree. <coughs> well, I, I think um, Campbell's quite right that there are legal, there are legal challenges in the way. Uh, I would disagree with him when he says that we, we are missing a trick by, by looking at that alone, because we're not looking at that alone. We're looking at a range of, of, of measures that could reduce harm. But price is certainly one of them, and the minimum unit price is much the fairest because it targets heavy drinkers and it targets those that gravitate to the, to the, cheapest, yeah. the cheapest drink. And I don't think we should be put off by Brussels. Uh, we have a, a government, if it, were, if it wished to be strong against Brussels, could. The Scottish government's advice is that it would be legal in Scotland. There are nuances of difference between Scotland and England uh, in, in the legal base that may make it more difficult in England. But let's not be put off by, by the bureaucrat, bureaucrats of Brussels. Let's go for what we think is the, is the best solution for our for our patients and our public. So I must correct one thing. There's no, there's no difference between Scotland and England in terms of law on this basis. There can, I, can I come back on that? There is, because Scotland does not have independent powers to raise tax. Indeed, and that, and that is no excuse within the European Treaty or the World Trade Organization. It, Countries cannot hide behind their internal tax it, mechanisms to avoid their international it, it, it obligations. It changes the difference as to whether it is action taken in a, in a member state is proportionate or not. Uh, but this, it, will be seen, not this will be seen as a UK action, not a Scottish it's not action in Europe. If you can raise, it's not proportionate if you can raise your own tax, but it may be proportionate if you don't have tax raising abilities. Well, I personally think there should be a unit price, but I wanted to pick up with you the whole thing about the peer pressure. I mean, I think that one area where it has worked, for instance, it's, you know, you, do, you can go back, okay, quite a long way, where it was quite fashionable and funny to drink dry. It was seen oh. as an okay thing. It's now seen as an incredibly yes. bad thing. So, but that's worked within a peer group and not right across society. The, the trouble is, it seems to me that the people who drink the most live in a culture where it's fun and fashionable to drink the most and to end up with your skirt round your neck, drunk in the gutter, is seen as somehow a cool thing to be doing. Now, how do we get at that group of people? Uh, can I? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think if you look at, say, the last 30 years, um, you know, the, the days when, when I was at school, the passage of right was um, going into a pub and blagging your first pint. Um, and that might have been at 16 or 17, but it certainly wouldn't have been any earlier. And, and I swear, I remember the sixth form at school, you know, that's what we did. We tried to get into the pub to have a drink. And, and, and sadly, you know, drinking in pubs, that's not where children are now drinking. They're drinking far earlier. Uh, and many of them are actually drinking at home 
uh, and they are drinking in, in many cases with their parents' knowledge. And I just think that there's been there's been a sort of liberalisation, um, and, and, it, and it's not meant to have happened that way. It's just gradually like a cancer crept up on us that we that, that the relationship that we're having with alcohol is a little bit passe. It's absolutely fine. Going back to the smoking analogy that, that was being made, you know, if, if if you're having a summer barbecue and um, uh, an adult goes up to a 14-year-old and says, you know, lights up a fag and gives him one, people would be pretty shocked. They'd look at that and think, blimey, well, that's, that's, that's incredible. But if he pulled out, out of the, the, the black dustbin with the, the, uh, the, the cold water and, and, and ice and pulled out a small uh, um, green uh, Budweiser and took the lid off and said, there you go, uh, actually, a lot of people wouldn't bat an eyelid. That's true. And that's because the attitude of so-called responsible adults has shifted and needs to be a, a mindset back. So, well, actually, all the evidence is the longer you can delay your first alco alcoholic drink, the less likely you are to ha be a problematic drinker. So there's a responsibility on parents that if they're just given some really, really simple information and to hand that over through to their children because parents think that by the age of 14, 15, 16, their, their kids really don't care about their, their, many, their attitudes. You know, as teenagers, they, the, the, the parents think they don't have the influence. They're, all the research shows that parents have a huge influence even if they think they do not. So there's just a little bit of um, uh, coaching and building with, with both um, the areas of society where children are. They're either at school, they're either with their parents or they're somewhere else. And the somewhere else bit is a very difficult mm -hmm. one because that's when you're getting into treatment when you're trying to deal with the problem. But no matter how good your treatment programs are, I don't care what anybody says, you can treat for all you like. The moment you've done it, the next wave are coming through. We've got to do more preventative issues that work in schools and at home in the family. But do you think that uh, something that none of you have touched on is the whole st thing still of that there is a stigma about not being able to control your drink? That the reason why drink is so complicated versus smoking, I mean, smoking is universally mm. bad for mm. everybody. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, mm. it's a bummer. Yeah. Um, as someone who smoked mm. most of my mm. life and don't anymore, I mean, I, mm. I know that. But, you know, the drink thing is very complicated because it's fine for 90% of people and it's mm. awful for 10%. And how do you. Not at any point in any of your presentations has a thought of how you communicate that and how you make it somehow okay for people to admit they can't handle it, admit they're in that 10%. I'd suggest that the, it's very difficult, but the best way of doing it is to try and enhance public disapproval of drunkenness. I'd say. I mean, I, I agree that, that the uh, um, people not driving when they've had a few drinks um, used to be seen as a great lack and um, peer pressure, um, the views of frowning of other people in the pub or where if you're drinking puts people off doing it. Now, I think those changes are important and I think they're the best way forward. But how there's no you, idea. How do you make a law to ban someone who's drunk from a pub? I mean, how does the landlord decide? I mean, they got to be being sick, falling down. I mean, it's quite a tricky thing to say that could be put into law. I mean, you could abuse it incredibly. You Clap could. Somebody you didn't like the You face. could, but you could just, I mean, it would be at the publican's discretion. The publican already has a right not to serve someone mm. with alcohol if he chooses. I suppose it would be rather encouraging that that should take place and try and encourage the general public to reinforce um, and encourage a publican to refuse to drink someone who's... I mean, the law already allows publicans not to serve people, requires publicans mm. not to serve to people who are drunk. Mm. Okay, we're just going to mm. bring in a gentleman there. I'd like to ask you, Chair, in my capacity as a former uh, editor, whether you see a role for the media rather than the law in that kind of Oh, I think there's a huge role for it, but I also think that, you know, that there's a lot of glamour that still surrounds the drink industry in the way that... It's certainly advertised in the cinema, say, okay, it's not necessarily on mm -hmm. you know, TV, but it's the way that it is projected is that it is a wonderful thing. Therefore, if you are not someone who gets that wonderful thing, it's very it's difficult. By looking for images of people with their skirt above their head, I mostly find it showcased in tabloid newspapers. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I don't think you're wrong there. I think there's a whole culture. We, we are making that kind of excess seem a rather, you know, a pretty amazing thing to be doing when you're 14 years old. But coming back to the cinema, why would a responsible drinks industry have advertisements in the tw 12 category film full of, uh, of lively, colourful adverts for alcohol products oh, yes, when question. it's a 12 film? 
It happens all the time. I counted three on one occasion. Well, there is, are that, is that a responsible drinks industry that self-regulates? There, there are rules around the uh, promotion of alcohol which are based on uh, the audience uh, participation and audience uh, um, demographics, uh, and that's what the industry adheres to and uh, polices. Hang on a minute, but Ian's point is that these are films that are the black yeah, but, but, very young but, but, people. But, but, but the, the, the black, twelve, the twelve the people, a twelve, a twelve, twelve is twelve is about people not uh, under age of twelve not seeing. It's not about who is going to see it. So there will be plenty of adult people who are going to see that film, and the majority of people who are seeing it will be adult audiences. But That's going on with the whole way that drink is advertised, it is always advertised as an ultimately cool sophisticated product, much how we used to have Marlboro Man and the way that cigarettes were advertised. Well, for the majority of people, that it is a, a pleasurable experience and it's a sociable experience. And one of the things that's recently come out, some recent research, is actually, it's less about the, the advertising, but actually the portrayal of, uh, advertise, of um, alcohol in uh, soap operas and on television programs, where it is the excesses that t tend to be shown, and that's reinforcing this concern that we all have, which is somehow that inappropriate and excessive drinking is somehow today's norm. If the, um, this is a kind of question for everybody, I mean, if the price to the national health keeps on rising at the pretty staggering rate that it's rising now because of not so much that more people are drinking, but that fewer people are drinking more, um, doesn't that also start to make a demand for some kind of legal challenge to this? I mean, that we're spending so many billions on children coming through the NHS now. Well, I mean, certainly, when you, some of the, the, the products that were, are available now and their alcoholic content are very, very high, very sweet, very sickly. They weren't available many, many years ago. Nor uh, alcohol pops. No, that's what, I'm talk that's what I'm saying. So, so I think that there, that there is that. I mean, um, uh, and I think that's why. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm really frightened about sometimes the university culture with a 20-year-old just gone through his first year and seeing, you know, the photographs of the games that, but you know, we, we, they play games now around alcohol, and that's, you know, I just think that's that's just incredible. I just, you know, that, that it's a, just a total body abuse, and it's seen as a laugh and a bit of fun. But you know, when you're on, you know, you're, they're off on holiday doing that, and someone slips off the side of a cliff, or someone drowns in a pool, and all the rest of it. Suddenly, you'll get a media exercise in what we're going to do. But we still do not want to sort of look at some of the programs which are there staring us in the face to try and at least combat some of that. I mean, let's, let's be clear here, you know, a lot of young people go through that and come out the other side perfectly fine. And I'm sure we've all done something really stupid when we've had one too many, um, and you're fine. But, but what we're trying to say is that there are segments of society who have, one, have a propensity for risky behaviour. They'll go a little bit further than everybody else. Um, we have the ability to be able to find out who some of those people might be and to deal with it. But, but I, I, I agree with you, Rosie. I think when you start to see now, when you go back to the 1920s after mass production of cigarettes and suddenly you saw this massive swathe of lung cancers that never existed in Victorian times coming through, and, and the surgeon would say, come and have a look at this to the students because you won't see this, this is really rare, and suddenly it's everywhere. I, I, you're seeing that now with, with liver disease in, in, a, in a, an age group that we've never seen before. Yep. Now that's taken a few decades to filter its way through, but watch it filter through a bit more because of the ones who are drinking now. So I, I do think it's a wake up call, but what I would caveat with it is alcohol is a wonderful part of our social lives and fabric and culture. So we have a responsibility to do it properly. Yeah, we just have to get well, the, we have to get re-normed. Well, it's, yeah, because yeah, the it's social just, norm about it has gone way off the spectrum. You're absolutely right. 